Shabbat Shalom for the very last time in 2020 and welcome to our weekend service at Church of Our Saviour. Thank you for joining us even as we uh, take this week to look back at all the things that have transpired in 2020 and to bring our hearts before God in uh, thanksgiving and with gratitude. What a year this has been. A year marked with many international events. The drone strike that killed the Iranian general, some of you may remember in January. The uh, second Libyan civil war, some of us didn't even know this happened. Uh, the impeachment of Donald Trump, how could we miss that? You know, it was in every news cycle again and again. Uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 in China, of course, and then globally. Malaysia's Pakatan Harapan collapses, giving way to the new Perikatan Nasional. Najib was also convicted and finally put in prison. The single biggest Dow Jones drop in all of history. Wow, many of us were probably stunned by that. The resurgence of Ebola in the Congo in Africa. The huge explosion that uh, many of you remember seeing the videos of in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, Air India Express Flight 1344 crashes and a number of people died. Shinzo Abe resigns as Japanese PM after being the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history. And about 1.7 million deaths worldwide from COVID-19. And now, of course, we have the most contentious of uh, American elections uh, in recent memory. You know, closer to home, we also had our own circuit breaker and a mad rush for toilet paper and for instant noodles. Unprecedented uh, restrictions came upon us as you know we are not allowed to travel freely or go around and mingle freely. The entire economy ground to a halt. Businesses just went out altogether because they just could not survive. And to the uh, chagrin of all our students, MOE decided that exams will continue even with COVID-19. You know, studying is important, right? And of course, our national economy suffered the worst recession ever since our independence. What a year 2020 was. I think that many of us are probably going to be a little bit happy to see 2020 go. Now, Paul, in writing to the Colossian church, he admonished them in this way. He says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, he says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all, these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God Rule in your hearts, to which you were also called in one body, and be thankful. Paul, you know, writes to this church, telling them how to behave, how to be a true church, a true kingdom of God. And I don't know if you have noticed this, but our emphasis for this couple of years has been to build a kingdom of love, where God's love can be felt and not just heard about, but it can be seen something quite tangible, Paul says that we should not just uh, talk about it, but to show our love towards one another by being kind and humble, putting up with one another and always forgiving. You know, the kingdom of God really isn't rocket science. And these simple things, though they are simple, but if we do them, they're going to result in God's peace in our community. And this is God's command through Paul to us and when that happens, you know, you get that special ironic blessing, right? When God commands a blessing, when brothers dwell together in unity. This is what we have been trying to do. To focus on what God focuses on. The greatest of all is love. And that's what we have been doing in Church of Our Savior. We've been focusing on faith, hope and love. But love being the greatest of all. We've been talking about building our community. 2020 has been a test of that community. And, you know, I think you guys have passed with flying colors. You know, give yourself a pat on the back. Well done. Now, having said all that, Paul ends with three little but very important words. And those words are, and be 
thankful. Okay, you can say it with me and be thankful. Now look at it. Look at 2020. On the surface, there really doesn't seem to be very much to be thankful for. It seems as though every month would bring on a bigger calamity or bigger disaster uh, than the last one. Just when you think that things could not get worse, it somehow manages to surprise us by actually becoming worse. And this lingering effects, you know that it's not just going to be 2020. You, you somehow see down the road that these effects are going to carry on for the years to come. But gratitude is less about our circumstances and more about our attitude. When it comes to looking at the things that have gone by, we really can have two ways of going about our attitudes. We can either look at what we are losing or we can look at how far we have come. Take a guess. Which one do you think God would want us to have? Now, there is a passage in the Gospel of Luke in which Jesus was talking and describing the last days. And in this middle of this description about the calamity that would happen in those times, Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 and verse 32, In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Now what is there to remember about Lot's wife? We actually don't know very much about her. And what has that got to do with our attitude of gratitude? To find out, we're going to have to look at the passage that speaks about Lot's wife. And this is found in Genesis chapter 19. And the context of the passage was the destruction of the city of Sodom. Now the man of Sodom, and this is a city in the south of Israel, south of the Dead Sea, in the, in the desert area. The man of Sodom had tried to violate, to molest, you know, to violate the angels who had visited that city in the appearance of two men. Now because of this, a great destruction was appointed on that city. Genesis chapter 19, verse 12 to 14. Let me read this to you. Then the man said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city. Take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Okay, So these two angels warned Lot and his family that the great judgment was about to befall Sodom and they, they needed to get out of that place. Okay, I mean, this was, this was a terrible problem and they had to get out and escape. But the sons-in-laws, they did not believe the man. They, they thought, you must be joking. I mean, look around us, you know, how can things be bad? You know, it's a bit like all of us looking uh, at the future in 2019, thinking, well, how bad can things be, right? Well, pretty bad, all right? So they did not believe them. And the Bible said that they thought, uh, they thought Lot was joking. They thought the angels were joking. So they were reluctant to leave that wicked place. So when morning came, the angels had no choice but to literally take Lot by the hand and drag him and his family out of Sodom. In verses 15 to 16, it says, When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the man took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, for the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And you know, I find it interesting that Lot, the Bible says, he lingered. So much so that the angels thought, what are you waiting for? They grabbed him and they just dragged him out along with the whole family because, you know, the danger was coming. So they took him by the hand 
led him out of Sodom. Now the Hebrew word for this word lingered uh, means something like he dragged his feet, right? Or he was slow to go. He didn't want to go. He was reluctant to go. Now, why do you think that Lot was reluctant to leave Sodom? You know, even with this warning of great danger coming. I guess he had a lot invested in Sodom, right? I mean, this was the, the city that he chose when Abraham gave him the choice. You know, he chose the good part. So I guess it was a good city. It was a well-established place. He had spent some years there. His family had grown up there. His career probably has been established there. You know, and he probably had some uh, sentimental memories uh, about Sodom. As wicked as the place was, his daughters were married to the men of the city anyway. And this may have been some of the reasons why he lingered on. He was looking back. There was a there was a heart heartache, you know, something was holding him back to this city as wicked as it was. And it had such a hold on Lot that even in spite of the impending danger, he really did not want to let go of Sodom. For him, Sodom represented the good old days. You know how it's like, right? We all look back and we think about the good old days. I, I find myself doing this a lot and it worries me because I think I must be getting old because I'm thinking, you know, the best songs, they are in the 80s. 80s and 90s songs are the best, right? I can't understand these new songs. You know, I came in like a wrecking ball. This stuff doesn't work for me. You know, the good old days back when, you know, you just remember those good times. I guess Lot was thinking of Sodom as a representation of the good old days and the good old ways. Now the text tells us the reason why Lot and his family were saved. And it was because God was being merciful to him. I mean, God could have wiped out Lot and his family along with the rest of Sodom, right? I mean, there's, there's no particular reason to save him. But this was a blessed family. And I personally think that it was because of Abraham's intercession. God was giving face to Abraham by saving Lot because he was very dear to Abraham. Now, if you ask me, I'd say that Lot had a lot to be grateful for. Wouldn't you feel the same way if you averted a disaster or was plucked out of a major calamity and spared? During the 9-11 uh, disaster, there were some people who almost went to the building and somehow by a turn of events, they somehow were prevented. Either their flight was delayed, you know, some their car broke down, they were not able to go. And eventually when they heard the news, they felt so relieved, so special that somehow they were spared of all the people who died there. I guess this was the same for Lot. He just averted a major disaster. Now, as the, as the angels sent Lot and his family along their way, they were given a warning, and this is found in verse 17. So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life, go! Do not look back, or do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Now you have to understand something, right? The the southern part of Israel, around the Dead Sea, is pretty much flat all the way. You have to run quite far north to go into the mountains, the wilderness of Judea, right? You have to run up towards Jerusalem, and there you'll be safe. And he said, don't linger on. Don't, don't be reluctant. Go quickly. Escape. Keep moving forward, lest you be destroyed. Now, Lord, you know, I guess he, that was just his character. He began to bargain with angels, and he said, you know, I, I really don't want to go to the mountains, right? Uh, there's this small city here called Zoar. Can I have this city? Just spare this city. Let me live in it because I really, uh, I, I really do not want to escape to the mountains. Well, this is what it says in verse 19. It says, Indeed now, this is Lord bargaining. Your servant has found favor in your sight. So he knows, right? He knows that he's got favor. And you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, no, no, lest some evil overtake me and I die. You know, in Chinese, uh, I guess this is something like Lord saying to the angels, you know, angels, uh, you are so good to me. Uh, but uh, since you have saved me 
might as well do something a little bit more for me. Okay, don't send me to the mountains. Give me this little city. Now, Lot realizes that he has found favor in the eyes of God. And I guess you could say that he wasn't the outdoor living kind of guy. He was more of a city dweller. And he didn't want to live in the mountains. He was afraid of the mountains. And the angels exceeded. God exceeded. So God withheld destruction from this one city, Zoar, so that Lot could run there and he could live there. Now Zoar was just like at the south southeastern edge of the Dead Sea, right? Just by the by the water and uh, in what is modern day uh, Jordan. Lot realizes this and he goes there. God on his side does not destroy Sodom until Lot arrives at Zoar. Verse 23 to 26. Now the sun had risen upon the earth, and when Lot entered Zoar, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So the destruction that came was utter and complete. It was an unprecedented disaster. And it wasn't just Sodom. It was Sodom, one city, Gomorrah, another city. And in fact, the whole plain was rocked into the ground like a massive earthquake. And then comes this bit that Jesus was referring to when he said, remember Lot's wife, right? Now, Lot's wife is actually not named, but some Jewish traditions call her Ado, you know? Uh, I guess when you see what she did, you also say Ado. <laughs> the Bible says that Lot's wife looked back behind him and she became a pillar of salt. I think sometimes we we kind of fixate on this pillar of salt. You know, you know sometimes when you go to Israel and drive uh, down south of the Dead Sea, they'll point to you some uh, structure that says, oh, that, that one is the pillar of salt. Of course it's not, right? But, you know, I think sometimes we look at that part of the verse. But, I think the interesting part is when she looked back behind him. What exactly was it that she did, this Ado, Ado lady, right? Zoar was quite a long distance from Sodom. And being on the edge of the Dead Sea, it means that you're lower than most of the surrounding region. Such that if you looked out, you probably can't see very much, right? Because you're below the level of the, the, the common land. And if you look at the direction of Sodom, probably the most you could see would be the smoke coming out as a result of the fire that was uh, going on in, in the whole plain in the city of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. So what was she looking at? You know, what, what does she have to see behind, uh, behind Lot? Well, the word looking here can also mean desire or long for something. So besides the physical glancing backwards, Towards Sodom, it seems that Lot's wife's heart had also remained in Sodom, right? That while she was physically in Zoar, her desire, her longing was for her past. She was mourning that which has been destroyed and lost. For all you know, this uh, wife of Lot may actually have been from uh, have been from Sodom itself. So maybe that's her memories, her childhood memories. So she was longing. And instead of relief and gratitude for her salvation, hers was a desire for what had been passed. Not unlike how the children of Israel would often long for Egypt, even though they were slaves there. You know, it's a funny thing, right? When you think about the past, you really only remember the good times. You, you don't remember the painful stuff and all that. That's kind of blotted out. And these children, when they were... Children of Israel, when they were brought out of Egypt, you know, they were having a hard time. But once they're out, they forget the hard times. Saying, oh, you know, in Egypt, we had fish, you know, we had good food and all that stuff. And they look back longingly to that which had already been destroyed, that which is already in the past. Today, as we stand on the cusp of a new year, between 2020, that is past, and 2021, that's about to arrive, I guess we are in a place a little bit like how uh, Lot was when he arrived at Zohar. The past behind him 
the future uncertain and unknown. Just as we too look with some trepidation to 2021, what will this year bring? I guess some of us will say, well, 2020 is the rock bottom. There's nowhere to go but up from here. And that may well be true, right? Yeah, optimist kind of guy. But then again, you know, 2020 has proved to us that, you know, things can always get worse. <laughs> so that we are looking at this year with some trepidation, with some uncertainty. And Jesus is telling us, remember Lot's wife. Today, even as we are listening to this at this last Sunday of the year, remember Lot's wife. And what does that mean? Do not cling to things that are already over, things that are already passed, things that, you know, water that's already under the bridge. Sure, sometimes, you know, uh, we cannot let go of it emotionally. Uh, maybe in our mind is there all the time. You know, remember Lot's wife. Because if you keep looking at the past, you will be destroyed. You'll be turned into a pillar of salt. Remember Lot's wife. I think uh, we can also choose to look at how far God has brought us. How far God has brought you individually how he has saved us. And I think we can all agree that we have really received God's mercy and favor. And God, this God is a good God who is bringing us to a better place. He's taking away, taking us out of the destruction, out of the calamity, trying to bring us to a better place, to a higher place. So what can we thank God for in this year? Firstly, we can thank God that we have been kept safe. I Wherever you are, you better say amen, right? We have been kept safe in spite of the crazy outbreak in the dormitories. The total casualties from COVID-19 in Singapore stands at 29. Now, 29 is still a lot for those people who are affected. But compared to other countries, you know, 29 is just amazing. It's among the lowest in the world, especially considering, considering the nearly 60,000 cases that we had. Today, there are zero dormitory cases and there are zero cases who are still in ICU. I'm not sure about you. I personally feel like God has shown us his favor. I'm not quite sure why, but he has been merciful to our little island, Singapore. And for that, I'm grateful. I'm relieved and I'm thankful. Number two, God has prepared us for this. You know, two years ago, I suddenly felt and urgency to start certain initiatives to support our church, Kuz Business and you know uh, SIGs and all these things, and to support our church members in their businesses for when an economic recession would arrive. Somehow in 2018, the end of 2018, I started thinking, you know what, there, there's going to be a, a great economic recession. And I'm not quite sure when, maybe it's in going to be in 2019, you know, but we need to get our support network together. We need to collect the names of all businesses and encourage our members to support one another's business. Now, at that time, I shared about Pharaoh's dream of the seven years of plenty, right? Which is the time that you should prepare for the seven lean years. Now, as a result, we started doing all these different in initiatives. You know, we push hard towards more decentralization as a church. I remember uh, we had some of these decentralized services a few times. It was difficult to do, but we did it a couple of times, you know, having cells run it instead of having a centralized uh, service as usual. It turns out this was the fire drill. We just didn't know it, right? And I just wanted to obey God and it turns out that God was ahead of us. He knew and you know what? He loved us enough to warn us. Who would have known but God himself? And I realized that God had been kind to Church of Our Savior, to all of us in this place. He gave us some runway to build up our community, you know, our zones, our, our different networking, our ways of connecting and distributing the, the leadership and empowering people to do the ministry. And it is working well. It really has worked well. So I thank God for them and I thank God for your obedience and your cooperation, right? We did not linger on. You guys, you know, jumped into it. We had cluster passes and all that. You know what? It is paying off for us. So I thank God for that. Thirdly, we had a tremendous harvest in 2020. The year has, this, this year, the church has really stepped up. All throughout this year, we have had to adjust 
how we do church and a large part of uh, that strategy of adjusting lies in empowering our lay people. That is every one of you. You guys are the key. Our various ministries, whether it's cells, uh, SIGs, and even Cafe OACs, Men at Coos, Koinonia, and many others that I probably didn't name, all these ministries have continued to thrive amazingly in this time. And we have seen that through your ministries, many people have come to the Lord and they are still coming to the Lord and uh, there have been many baptisms this year, more than usual, I almost feel, right? Because almost every week, I get some news about people coming to the Lord, people getting saved, people getting baptized. It's crazy. I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, why doesn't this happen when things are, are good? But clearly, because the Lord has prepared us for a time of harvest. In this time, when everyone is looking at the gloom, we are actually in the bloom. You know, God is really causing the harvest to come for us. So, you know, I, I really thank God uh, for all these people who are not just being converted because in the past, we still had conversions in the past, but many of those conversions did not end up in the church, did not end up in community. We had a big front door, but our back door is just as big, right? So people just come right through. But this year, people are not just being converted. They are being adopted into our community, into the kingdom of God here at Kuz. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm so excited about that. Now, not only that, the number of people in cells have grown by a few hundred since the, the time when we started all these initiatives throughout this year. And our recent bespoke project, we have been reaching out to people everywhere, you know, going into the community, saying hello to people, trying to find out connect connections and people who are somehow lost in the, in the crowd. You know, we have actually managed to form quite a few cells just by connecting these people. I tell you, it's, it's something quite different, quite unexpected. And I suspect it may be something that many of us cannot see just yet because only I can see this by looking from the top and I want to share with you that God is doing something quite amazing, right? Don't worry, don't worry. God is fully at work. The church is alive. We thank God for that. Now, many people were worried about what would happen to the church with all this lockdown. What will happen to all these different churches? And we have reports that across the board, there's been a decline of 8% in basically in churches all, all in Singapore. I'm happy to say that our community have stepped up so much and in so many ways. We have the means today to help our church members who are struggling financially and because we are trying our level best to be a real family in Christ who take care of one another in every way, right? Not just pray for you. Lah. We actually want to help you because we are a real family. Now, not only that, we have enough to financially help other churches churches that are struggling with you know with their situation including my Saviour's church 316 church marine parent uh, christian center where pastor joseph has been seconded now he's going to be back in 2021 so that's got to be one of the celebrations that we have right we have reached out harder to our communities and sought out more lost sheep than ever we have established a great ministry now in uh, uh transit point Right, where we have a garden there, we are reaching out, getting to know the people there. Uh, and all this started with a home away from home project, you remember, where we managed to you know, uh, use this place to be a shelter for the Malaysians and people who are stuck. It was a wonderful thing to be able to serve. Alpha has been incredibly fruitful. I just heard that uh, Constance and the Stepping Out, they have had 12 people come to the family of God through Alpha this year. And 12 baptized, you know, that's amazing. Even our mission strategy has taken a digital twist. We are reaching people that previously we never reached. Normally, we will fly our missionaries out to Osaka, but because of the uh, lockdown, nobody can fly anymore. So we've gone online and made new friends and we're really quite effective in reaching out. So, you know, some wonderful things are coming out from this COVID-19. I believe that if not for COVID-19, quite honestly, we have continued to do things the same old way. But through this, God has taken us by the hand, just as the angels took Lot and his wives and the daughters by the hand. Because, you know, we are creatures of habit. We don't want to change. And so God has taken us to a better place. God is delivering us from some of these problems that we never recognized because we're still longing for it, right? Just as uh, Lot and uh, his wife longed for Sodom, they didn't recognize the problems. God did. And he's delivering us and he's bringing us to a better place. Yes, we have had to let go of our tried and tested ways of doing things, 
we have had to give up many of the things that we have come to cherish and uh, you know and become familiar with but when we count our blessings we realize that in the midst of the calamity god has shown us all great favor and mercy more than that i know that 2021 is going to be god leading us to something quite amazing right his will and we are becoming a better church as a result a better reflection of the kingdom of god that's the result now we will have challenges and we have had many this year but you know as i remember lord's wife my focus is the faith that overcomes those challenges faith in the god who's ultimately good towards us now before we go i want to challenge you to think about those things that you may be looking back towards perhaps like lord's wife there are things in your life that you may be clinging on to that god is trying to take you by the hand and drag you out of it but you for some reason maybe sentimentality or you know whatever the reasons maybe you're lingering on or maybe like lord's wife you're just looking back desiring you know wanting to go back to the past but god is saying no you need to go and escape this because god's plan is to bring you to a better place now perhaps there's something that you need to do before we cross out of 2020 and i pray that even as we come to the end of this year our hearts will be full of faith gratitude and thankfulness to god would you pray with me lord we thank you for your mercy your favor and your kindness towards us yes it has been a time of great change unprecedented difficulties have come upon us but in the midst of all of that you have been good to us lord we acknowledge you have saved us and you are saving us so today lord give us a spirit of not lingering on help us to remember lord's wife so that we can turn from the past look forward in faith and walk in step with you in the name of jesus we pray amen amen and god bless you